thread painting. I love thread painting, but many people are intimidated by it and I totally understand that. I, I get it and I was the same way at first. But I think they're, one of the reasons for that intimidation is that, um, you, you know, sometimes when you look up tutorials for it, it can seem like it's very exact about how, how long or short your stitches are supposed to be, and it has to be placed in just exactly the right way, and it's a super precise technique. Well, you know, I'm not saying those are wrong, um, but for me, it's a very relaxing stitch because I am not that precise about how long or short my stitches are. And as I get into this explanation, I think you'll see what I'm talking about. So speaking of long and short, it goes by a couple of different names. Long and short stitch is kind of the, you know, name that's been around for a while. It's also called thread painting or needle painting. I rarely call it long and short. I will refer to it as thread painting or needle painting interchangeably. So you might hear both of those. And let's talk about strands first. That's a very common question about thread painting, how many strands to use. And again, the very traditional, you know, you could only use one strand for thread painting. And that is true. One strand is great. It depends on the look you want. Uh, in general, again, I'll get into this a little bit more here in a minute, but in general, one strand will give you very smooth, subtly blended shades of color together. Two strands will give you, you can achieve that too. It's just a little chunkier. I've also thread painted with three strands. It's just a chunkier look. It's not wrong or right. It just depends on the look you want. All right, so that's my short spiel about that. Let me give you a quick definition of really what it means, um, you know, sort of the, the, you know, the actual definition of it. And this diagram will be in the PDF instructions. Sorry, I just printed it up quickly here so it's a little bit light um, and tiny. But um, it's really just rows of stitches that are in different lengths, thus the long and short title but I call them staggered so that the lengths are different and where the thread goes in or out of the fabric is different on every single one that's next to each, you know, each stitch is next to each other. Well, that was confusing, sorry. So that's really just sort of the basic definition. Staggered stitches of different lengths in usually, not always, but sort of generally in rows. And I use that term rows sort of loosely. I don't mean like rigid rows. It's not that, you know, precise, but what I mean by rows in this sense is like you do a section here and then this next section, you're moving up a little bit and then the next section you go and then you do another row, all right? So that's sort of the general definition. Let me do a quick demonstration of what I'm talking about to make it a little bit easier. I'm gonna do it in markers first, but I will show you some stitching, but this is sort of just quicker so I can just explain what I'm talking about. So pardon the highlighter orange, it's really bright, but it's the only orange marker I could find. And you'll see here on this diagram that I've already done, it shows a row of yellow stitching along this edge, just this outside edge. And that's not required, but I like to do it this. When I do it, I'll show you in a minute. It's just a, a split stitch with three strands. And I'm gonna be stitching over that, but having a row of stitching along the edge like that gives you a nice defined edge. It also gives you sort of a more dimensional edge, which I really like. It almost look, looks like a rolled edge. So I really like that, it's a nice touch. Okay, so that's what you see, that's already been done. So now it's time to start our actual stitching. When I do this first section, again, this is not the same every time, but pretty often I do this, I'm going to use two strands. Let me back up a little bit. On this specific petal, on these flowers, I'm going to mostly use one strand, but for this section right here, this first part, I'm gonna use two strands. And I like to use two strands because it is a little thicker and it fills in the area fast and you just wanna make sure this first section, this is important, is really filled very full so you don't see any color of the background fabric. So let me show you what I'm talking about. All right, so here we go. So you've got your first stitch. In general, 
my brain, I think because I'm a reader, I tend to work left to right. There is no right or wrong here. You can start on the right and go left. You can start on the left and or anywhere in the center and kind of go randomly. I generally, sort of, mostly, tend to work a little bit left to right. You can also, like this is an angled pedal. I know I'm talking a lot, not getting to the stitching, but it all will come together, I promise. Uh, so I'm going to pay attention to the direction of my stitches. So when they're over here, they're going to be this, this angle. When they're in the center, they're going to be this angle. And by the time I get over here, they're going to be this angle. If you want to draw yourself some guidelines to help you sort of keep in mind, these, this is a huge pedal. It's not this big, obviously, so it's really tiny. But if you want to draw yourself some guidelines to help with that as you're stitching, do that. That's always helpful. So now let's actually stitch. First color, two strands. I'm going to start over here and I'm going to make a stitch. And then I'm going to make a stitch next to it. And I'm just going to make sure that the where it ends is a different length because that we're working on this outside section. Obviously it's like a satin stitch along this edge. You want it to be very precise. It's in here on this row where you're paying attention to how long your stitches are. That's a really short one, longer, shorter, medium, long, short, medium. So do you see how that, how that works? See how staggered different all of the ends of these stitches are? They go over the split stitching on this side, but they're all precisely on the edge. These are different lengths. Another thing to note about what I am doing here. So see how this line right here is my pattern line of where that section, that row is. Look at how far into this second section where the second color will be. Look how far into that I went. That is important. I'll explain more about that in just a second. So let's say you get this whole thing stitched. I know you can see a little bit of white paper under here, but stitch this uh, enough, like I said, that it's very full and you cannot see any fabric underneath. It's easy on this blue fabric because it's really dark and so you can see through it. So that is our first row. Now it's time to do the second row. And now I'm switching to one strand. And I can hear you. I know there are people, there are, you are out there and you are saying to yourself, oh, one strand, that's gonna take forever. It's gonna be so tedious. I don't wanna do that. I said those exact same things. Trust me, it can seem tedious at first, but you know, we are not stitching. Each of these pedals is not six inches across. It's a small pedal. And so it goes much faster than you think. But also the control you get with the color, you know, and the, not the color so much, but the blending is great. It's wonderful with one strand. I think you'll probably learn to love it. But anyway, we're going with one strand. So now it's time to do the second row. It is important now when we come up and where we go down, we are going to stagger where the ends of the stitches are. It is also important where we come up to come up inside I'm going to do a random one right here come up inside the area you've already stitched and go down right here in into the next area the reason for that is if you come up in the unstitched fabric and go down in the stitched area you're going to get a little divot a little hole where that needle and thread goes down through your stitching when you come up through the previous stitching and you pull this thread that direction and you lay it down and you sort of, when you tighten it enough, it nestles, it buries itself, it blends with the stitches that are already there. That's partly how you get that really nice subtle blending. So let me show you in, you know, let me show you more. So coming up, I'm showing these kind of further apart, but obviously just like satin stitch or anything else, you're gonna want them to be close together, all right? But now I tend to really jump around a little bit more. I don't work 
you know, all the way across one little stitch after another. I will jump around a little bit more. So I might come up right here and go over here and come back. Hope you can see here. that I'm doing the same, oh, those are a little bit the same, so I might come back and add a, a shorter one in between. All right, now I know that's a little thin. When you were stitching, they're not gonna be quite that thin. You're gonna really, you know, fill that in again. But do you see how far into the first section that was already stitched that I came up? And how, and pro oh, okay, now I probably should have, this was a little wrong. I, when I come, came down, I should have gone more, made more stitches that came all the way down into this third area. That is critical, again, like I said, for blending the colors. All right, let me show you the third color now. So just pretend that's really nice and full. We're going to do this green in the very center, but the same thing applies. Come up in the stitched area and go down come way into that stitched area these ends are staggered obviously this will be you know all the same because it's the edge of the shape all right now these colors do not blend obviously because they are markers and they are wildly different colors but that is kind of that kind of gives you the idea let me tell you one of or couple of them maybe two issues that I see the most often that are I hate to use the word mistake but the things that people do where they are saying to themselves this doesn't look right I'm not getting the blending and here are here's what is going on and they're kind of related so you're doing your first row and you're doing this and you're kind of hesitant to go make them too different and to go too far into that second section. So yes, these ends are staggered, but they're not very staggered. They're not wildly different. Remember over here, they were like wildly different, like, like that. So that, and then, so that's kind of the first thing that happens. And then when you come to do your second color, if I can get the, Hang on, I can't get the lid off my marker. One second. All right, so when you come to do your second row, then again, you're hesitant to come too far into the, come up in, too far inside the first row. And so you start here and you go here, and then you are doing this. And you've kind of got this effect going on. Your stitches are really short. What's happening here is that everything is too similar. The ends are too close together. The length is too similar. And the real magic happens in thread painting, the blending of the colors, which is really what you're trying to achieve here, is where the two colors occupy the same area. So if you have your stitches like, you know, you've got one color here and you've got one color here, what you end up with is a hard line. You don't end up with, you know, a smooth you know blending of the color you end up with a hard line we're not doing satin stitch with where one shape butts up against another shape we're, we're blending these two colors so it's really i think those are the two most common mistakes is that you don't vary the lengths or where the ends go in and out of the fabric enough and you don't go far enough into the next area in which you stitch which are going to which you're going to stitch so those are the two most common mistakes so that's sort of the overview of what needle painting is lots of me yapping away let's actually stitch all right i've got the two strands uh, and the, there's a color diagram that tells you which color I use, you know, for the first area and the second area. Each petal is different, so they're not identical, every single one. But let me tell you this about the color. 
you can follow there will be a diagram in the pattern that tells you exactly on this petal i use this color here here and then the green is all the same in every single petal and this petal is this color and that color this one's different you can follow that diagram as close as i did if you want to just use whatever orange it's dark it's it's the dark pink the medium pink and the light pink and the dark orange and the medium uh, orange color that i used You, if you just want to like pick up whatever random beautiful orange or pink color you want to use, it'll be gorgeous. All right. So just if you don't want to be that wedded to the to the color diagram, you do it. That'd be great. Anyway, I'm using this is what I call the dark orange. You can see it's got some orange and some yellow and then some dark orange in it again. See that? All right. It's going to be gorgeous. That's one of the things about thread painting with variegated thread is you never quite know what it's going to turn out. And it's so much fun. So let's do the actual stitching. So I've got my split stitch edge on it along the outside edge. And I am going to stitch over that split stitch edge. And I'm already going way down into that next section that was a really long stitch. Now I'll make a shorter stitch. Like I said, if I want to, this first section, it doesn't matter if you come up here and go down here or come up on the outside and go down because we don't have any stitched areas. So you can go do either way, whatever you want. If you want to lay in some of those guidelines you can do that really just constantly make sure that the ends are staggered you can already see some of those different colors coming through like I said, though, just make sure it's really important that this area, this first section is really full. I'm going to make another, that was a sort of a short stitch. I'll make kind of a somewhere in between stitch. Make another really long one. All right, now see, I've got some gaps in here, so I'm going to go ahead. Let me talk to you about this. Okay. Normally, when I do satin stitch, I hope this makes sense. When I do satin stitch, you always come up, you know, up on one end and down on the other. And then on the back of the fabric, you go back and you come up on the same end and down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And I always do that because my satin stitch looks better that way. Why am I talking about satin stitch? Well, this first row is basically a satin stitch because there's you're not don't have any other stitching there yet so normally that's how i would do this because i am working with this thread that i have dyed and you know you may not you don't ever know quite how much you have of it or how much it's going to take and so it took some work to get that thread i'm going to break my rules a little bit so as i as you've been seeing me do i come up here and go down here but that uses a lot of thread on the back of the fabric. So there's a lot of thread that's underneath there from going around and around and around like this. So I want to save some of this beautifully colored thread. Plus I wanna have the color show on the front, not the back. So I'm gonna do sort of a thread saver technique. I don't recommend this for satin stitch. I never find that it looks good, but with this, it's okay. So this one, I went up here and down here. But right next to here, since it's a different length. I'm going to come up inside and go down on the outside. And now because I'm not trying to make a stitch right next to this one, I'm going to jump over here. Now I can just go from here and just go whoop, right over there. So I've just left a very tiny amount of thread on the back. So now I'm up here. And so my next stitch, I want it to be a long one. So I'm going to come up right here. So I've just used a very small amount of thread from there to there. And now I can come back. Now I'm down here. I can just ooch over back over to here. 
So I hope that makes sense what I'm talking about, about why I would not do it with satin stitch, but I will do it here because I am trying to save thread. And you'd be surprised how much of a difference, how much thread it saves when you don't constantly go around and around and around. But see how those beautiful variegated colors are popping through. All right, so I'm not gonna do this whole thing, but you see, I, I've got some sections in here to fill in. They're a little thin right there, but I'm gonna sort of work across to this side and I'll go back and maybe I'll go in and add some more where I have some spaces. All right, so let me go fill this whole section in. I feel like that section is sufficiently full. Notice again how far into the second section, like that line was actually about right here. Look how much of that stitching went all the way into that section. Now I'm ready to start my second row. And now I'm gonna to switch to one strand. I'm using the, on this particular petal, I think this one is the medium pink, which it's got some areas of dark pink and some lighter colors, really pretty. Same thing though, I'm now I'm gonna come up in the stitching and go down. Come way up into where it's already been stitched. Like I said, one of the biggest mistakes I see people make is they're too afraid to come way up inside the stitching and they stick right to the edge. Don't be afraid to come up in that previous stitching because that's where the colors get blended. And what I was talking about, about when you pull the thread, so I've got one strand here, and when I pull it in, and when I pull it this direction, it gets sort of buried. Not buried so much, but I mean it, it lays down into those stitches that are already made. Speaking of which, when I come up into right in here, I want to split the stitches that are already there. I'm not trying to avoid that. You won't always necessarily split a stitch, but you want to split those stitches. If it happens, that's great. Same thing, it helps those threads blend even more when you split stitches. I don't even pay attention to what I'm doing. I just know that they are getting split and that's fine. This is, um, now I talked about how you could either, you know, go up here and down or up here and, you know, change directions. Now I do not change directions. I always come up inside the previously stitched area and down in the unstitched area. But just as before, so see right here, see this is the last area, it's gonna be that green, I'm coming way down into that, bringing lots of that pink down in there. I haven't talked much about angles so much, but I am paying attention to the angle. And you're, like I said, you're probably thinking, oh, one strand is gonna take forever, but it really doesn't. It's just really satisfying to see that, that one strand, the colors blend in here, especially with these variegated threads. But even with solid color threads, it's just, it's really enjoyable to see those colors as they start to show up. So I've kind of worked from left to right, but now obviously I don't have nearly enough here. I've got, you know, fabric showing right in here and here and here. So now I'm just gonna keep working back across. Now some of that really dark pink is showing up, so pretty. Again, I'm still though coming up inside and just making sure that the ends on this end are not next to each other and the ends on the other. In other words, where the thread comes up and goes down. So now I'm just filling in wherever I see kind of a thin spot. Sometimes it helps when you come up, especially with these angles, if you're not quite sure where to go down, this is a little trick if you're really struggling to figure out where, because you don't want, I didn't really mention this, but like if I've come up here, 
I don't want to have a thread that goes at a at a different angle. I want all these angles to sort of flow in the same direction. So see how if I were to, you know, come across here and put that down there, it's going to like be it's not going to bury itself down in the other stitches. I want to make sure that I'm at the correct angle. So if you're not sure, you can take this thread and lay it down and you can see, okay, the, you know, I don't want to put it down here. That's not the right angle. I have a little space right there I'm trying to fill. So if I lay it down, I say, oh, okay, look, it really fills in that little area right there. If I lay it down right there, so I know I'll go down right here. I don't, you won't need to do that for every stitch, but if you ever need to just figure out which, I mean, I'll do it occasionally when I'm just not quite sure of my angle. But now you can see how, see how pretty those colors are all blending together. I still have staggered ends down here. All right, so now I think I'm done. So see how pretty that is all blended together. Again, like satin stitch, if you feel like they need a little help to kind of mush together, I take my fingernail and I'll kind of run it in the direction of the stitching and that helps sort of press the threads together and it gets a little shinier. So that's a little satin stitch trick that you can use for thread painting as well. And now all I have left is this last little green section. I've already done a few stitches of green, but the same exact thing applies. Come up in the previously stitched section and then go down at the edge of that shape. This area is really quick to stitch because it's not that big and I will again I love stitching with these variegated threads because you just never know how they're going to turn out they never turn out the same way twice I'll tell you that when I chose the colors for there's a flower the other flower there's two flowers that are done just exactly the same and I used the exact same you know recipes like you know this petal has uh, I think it's number don't quote me on this, it's number 10 and then number two, have, that's the numbering system I created for the dyed threads. And so the other flower also has a different petal, but it has 10 and two, and it looks completely different. You just, you're not gonna get the same thing every time, even when you use the exact same thread. So I think I'm just about done with that. No, a little bit of blue fabric down in there that I wanna cover a bit more. And half the battle with smoothly blended needle painting is the colors you choose. But I've already done that for you, so you don't have to worry about that at all. I know these colors all visually blend together really well. So I think maybe one long green one right there in the middle. Okay, I think my green section is done. For the center of this flower, we're going to do just a quick padded satin stitch. And you can pad, all that means is that you are putting something underneath a layer of satin stitching to raise it up a little bit. You can use different stitches. You can do just like a little seed stitch, just random little bitty short stitches. I just put a layer of satin stitch underneath. I'm using three strands of the yellow, not, not dyed, just plain yellow. And so I put one layer going one direction, and now for my final layer, I'm gonna go the opposite direction. First layer, how messy or not messy your satin stitch is just doesn't matter. And really, the second layer, or at least the edges of the second layer, aren't really that critical either on this one because we're gonna be covering it up with uh, French knots. So it's not like you have to have this super precise uh, edges like you would have on a shape that you're, that, you know, that would be seen. But otherwise, just a satin stitch over that first layer. All right, let me go finish that up really quickly. Before I move on, here's a really quick little satin stitch trick. Um, it's called using your needle. <clears throat> Oops, I pulled up a previous stitch. Okay, it's called using, using a laying tool. And you can buy a specific tool for this, but I just use my needle. And so if you have uh, a stitch that's just, when it lays down, it's just sort of twisted, 
and it doesn't lay really nice and smooth. First of all, make sure you're stripping your threads to separate them. I have a video on that. Very important. I strip all of my threads, except for, like I said, when I'm doing couching stitch. But anyway, so if you're trying to get those strands to all be parallel and sit smoothly, put your needle underneath. On the back side, I'm taking that thread and I'm pulling on it back and forth like this. So I'm holding that thread because if I just let go on the back, it's going to pull up. So I'm holding it on the back and then I'm just using, I'm holding it and using that needle to just sort of tease those strands flat. And then as I pull to the back, I release my needle and it's a little uneven because I accidentally pulled up when I was trying to pull that stitch back a little bit. I picked up another strand, but I'm just going to let that go. This is such a small area. Another thing you can do with satin stitch is use your fingernail and sort of maybe get the strands to line up that way. Get them all to smush together and kind of act like one. This is not a huge area of satin stitch, so it's not like these stitches have to be exquisitely perfect. All right, I'm almost done with that. All right, this ring around these petals, and I just noticed I forgot to put the green stitching on that petal right there. So I'm gonna go do that first. I'll be right back. All right, back to the center of the flower. This ring is going to have, is just gonna be filled up with French knots. I am now using the dark orange dyed thread. I'm using two strands and I love doing groups of French knots with dyed thread, with a variegated thread because there's just the, the color changes are subtle and it's just a really pretty way to show off, one of the many ways to show off a variegated thread. So let's talk for a moment about French knots and I have a full length video that's very detailed. If you are struggling with your French knots and you want to go watch all of that, I will give you the quick version here. French knot, come, let me just do one over here. So you come up, you're gonna hold your thread coming out of your fabric with this hand, with your other hand, and then you're going to wrap the thread around the needle. Some people wrap this way, some people wrap towards them. It doesn't matter which one you do. I just, I would say just be consistent. I wrap away from myself. So I am wrapping and when I wrap, I'm being careful not to pull really hard so that these are super tight on the needle. I don't want them so loose that they're like not up against the needle, but do not do them so tightly that they're just choked up on there. All right, that's, that's the first thing you can do if you're having trouble. And so now I'm gonna hold, sort of give it some tension. I'm gonna make sure that's pulled back a little bit. And now I'm gonna put the tip of the needle down and you do not want to put the tip, uh, you know, insert the needle back in the fabric in the exact same hole that you came out of. Even if you move over one teeny, teeny, tiny little fiber of your background fabric, just don't put it down in the same hole because that's what's gonna happen there is a very common thing that happens. You put it back down, you pull it through and the needle pops to the back. That's because you've just pulled it back through that hole. So make sure you are putting it down just next to. So now I've inserted the needle, but before I go any further, I'm going to very gently pull that, those wraps towards the fabric. Again, not tight, but so that they're just up against the fabric. Now I put this finger here and sort of hold that thread in place. Make sure I'm going down vertically. And now I'm going to gently pull the thread through. Don't go too fast. Now see if I had just yanked this to the back super fast, all of these little twists would probably end up with a knot and not the kind we're looking for. So I'm going to go slowly. Okay. I have messed up this knot. Hopefully I can regain it. Someone got away from me. Okay. I managed to save it somehow. If your thread is getting tangled, you know, twisty like that, let it hang. It's kind of hard to show you right here, but let it hang, you know, hang down towards the ground 
and let the whole thread unspin, you know, untwist. When you do a lot of uh, French knots in a row, or sometimes just three or four knots in a row, just the way you're spinning that needle around, the thread can get twisted and it'll twist up on itself, makes French knots harder. But let me show you that again. Come up, wrap. How many times you wrap the needle will determine how big the knot is as well as how many strands you're using. Go down just next to where you came up, slide those wraps down, hold the thread. This time I'm going to have it not twist up on me so badly. And there's your knot. For this ring of knots, I am wrapping the needle either two or three times. And these are all really closely together, really close together. That one I did three times. You can let them sort of pile up on each other. That's fine. It's actually kind of what I want. That one I wrapped three times. Whoops. Ah, kind of have a little catch in there. So I'm going to do another three. And you can go faster as you get moving, but just watch out for that thread spinning up on itself. So I'm going to just keep doing this all the way around, wrap twi two times or three times around the, uh, around the needle and just fill in this whole ring. Finishing this flower just requires one more thing, but before I move on, you might notice, I don't know if you can tell, but I made a decision. I had made about six or seven French knots and I realized that the dyed thread I was using had big sections of just solid yellow in it. And I didn't want solid yellow French knots right up close to this solid yellow center. So I took those six or seven knots out. I probably should have just lived with it, but I wanted um, a thread that had more darker orange in it. So I cut those out and I started, I found a thread that had um, a longer section of just orange. So that's why that may look a little different. But the only other thing left to do now is to add a few more little teeny tiny French knots of white scattered kind of in a larger sort of uh, scattered around this um, ring that we've got here. So I'm using straight up white thread, two strands, and I'm only going to wrap once. So they're just little bitty knots and just scattered, maybe, you know, four or five knots, depending on the size of the petal. If it's a little tiny petal, maybe just three little knots. But all of these are just wrapped one time. And they get a little buried down in the threads, but you know, they make they make a difference. They just give it a little bit of sparkle. So that's all we have to do to finish up this thread painted flower. Let's hop right over here and stitch these sort of thin skinny leaves and we are going to use a fly stitch for these and fly stitch is really versatile. It is simple so let me show you how to do the fly stitch. As I said, the fly stitch is a very simple stitch. Let me just show you the basic fly stitch. So I have a line drawn here, ignore these holes over here and the holes running through here. That was from a previous project, but this is my practice hoop. Anyway, so here's the line you want to follow, let's say, for your fly stitch. You're going to come up on one side of the stitch. You're going to go down on the straight across, but on the other side of your line. Hold this thread open and then you're going to come down and come up on the center line. Now you can go down right here and that is a fly stitch. That's the just the simple one. Again, come up on the on one side, down on the other side, hold it open, come up inside that loop and go down. We are going to use the fly stitch a little bit. I mean, you can do all sorts of things. You can connect them. You can do them in, you know, in wavy lines, lots of things you can do. Here's what we are going to do with the fly stitch. I'll show you also on the actual stitching, but we're going to start our leaf 
aspect. Let me draw you a little leaf right here. Let's say here's our leaf. So we're going to come up at the top. The first thing we want to do for this leaf is to, let me move this up for you, is to make a straight line. And I'm going to come down pretty far. Now I'm going to start my fly stitch. So I'm going to come up, now this is pointed, this little end is pointed, so I'm going to come up just on the line, you know, on this left side line, but just to the left of that first stitch. I am going to go down on the other side, but right up next to that stitch. Now I'm going to come up right at the base of that first line we made pull that fly stitch and go down. Now I'm not going to go down way below that. I'm going to go down right underneath that. Now it doesn't look like much at the moment, but let's keep doing that. I'm going to come, I'm going to come back up to the left side, way back up there, almost towards the top again, down on the right side, come up right below the previous place. Pull that fly stitch so it sits underneath that kind of V. You know, there's a little V right there. It sits underneath the previous one and go down right underneath it. And as I work down the leaf, following the this outside line, like this, it will start to build up. And the really cool thing about using this stitch for leaves is it's maybe a little hard to tell on this dark green thread, but as you keep going down, you are creating these little stitches right here, create a, a nice little spine on the leaf, like a little center vein. So you won't have to come back and stitch anything to make this look like a leaf. The reason, let me show you again, the reason you want to All right, that's a little wonky, but that's okay. It's important to make this first stitch, as I mentioned, make it pretty long. Because if you make it really short, like this, and then you start trying to do your fly stitch, you'll get the same, you know, it'll work. But first of all, the stitches are super tiny. What ends up happening when you come over here and make that first stitch nice and long, you end up with very much of an angle for each stitch, you know, on each side. If you do it this way, if you make a little teeny short stitch, you're going to end up with a side that looks, it's kind of flattened out. It ends up looking like this. Now, is there anything wrong with that? No. This is just easier, first of all. You get more coverage out of fewer stitches. And it, this just sort of, I, I, I did it this way at first and realized that's not looking the way I want it to look. It just looks kind of jumbled up. When you do it this way, you get a nice strong angle which really conveys this, these are the, this is the direction that the leaf is growing. So that's a quick expl explanation. Let me show you on the actual hoop. Here we are on an actual leaf and I am using the variegated thread and of course this is going to look gorgeous. You can already see how that variation in, variation in color is already showing up. So I already have my needle here threaded and I'm going to start at the tip of this split leaf. Ooh, make sure I come up right in the center. And as I said, I want to make sure this stitch is long enough. When in doubt, make it a little longer than you think you might need to make it. So that stitch right there, I know it's hard for you to tell, it's probably, it's at least a quarter of an inch long. Now these leaves are a little smaller on this side. There's some over next to the other flowers that are a little bit larger. So you'll need to make that stitch even longer to fill those, um, those larger leaves. So anyway, now we're ready to start. And as I said, you're gonna come up way up at the top and right next to that stitch. Down on this side. And go down. 
and just make sure when you come back up to start your stitch again you go up high enough because you'll get that same problem with you know more horizontal stitches if you don't go way back up again but this is super easy and a really cool effect for little effort There's that difference in color showing up again. Never know what you're going to get. That's the fun of it. Okay, so you can see on these how you get that really cool little spine, that, you know, that interesting center vein look. So just keep these stitches really close together. I mean, if you wanted to do it, there's a different kind of leaf. You could do this exact same thing, but leave space in between these. So anyway, lots of options for the fly stitch. And so that's how we're going to stitch all of these long, skinny, pointy leaves on this hoop. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention. On these small ones, I'm using two strands. And when we go over to the larger leaves, I will use three strands. Now let's work on the, what I call the ruffled flower. And I am going to apologize for how ragged this pattern looks right here because I already had this completely stitched. This one and the two other little smaller flowers that, like this one over here, I had them completely stitched. They were finished. I had the video made, the, the instructions written, the photos taken, and I just did not like the colors and the way it turned out. It was more complicated and it bothered me. I thought about it for a week. It bothered me the whole time. I thought about it for over a week and I finally just did it. I said, I'm just going to rip it out and start over. And I am happier with what I have come up with. It is simpler. So I think you'll actually like it better. And so if you do see that other one, it's kind of like a dark burgundy with some light colored st stitches on top of it. If you see that flower or these flowers, in other parts of this video and you're wondering why am, am I not seeing it in the final video that's why because it got totally ripped out so on to the real one now the actual one I am using two strands of the um, variegated I think it's called dark turquoise blue purple so we get lots of variation in our colors and we are going to put long daisy stitches that fill that go up in an you know in an R that angle like this as they go around the petal to fill each petal. So I'm going to start in this petal that's kind of in the back and just like we always make a daisy stitch, you come up and you go down, back down into the same place that you came up, leave yourself a loop and then come up where you want the end of the stitch to be. And this is a little bit important. I am not coming up, if you can see this right here, I'm not coming up right on the line where the pattern is. I want the end of this stitch to be just inside the pattern because we're going to add a ruffled edge. And so if I had the end of the daisy stitch be on the exact pattern line and then we added the ruffle beyond that, it gets, the petals get a little bit larger than I want. If you do that, not the end of the world. It'll be fine, honestly. So, but I'm trying to come up just inside the pattern line. And there's my first daisy stitch. And these are daisy stitches that we're not gonna leave them really round, like a real teardrop. I'm gonna pull them enough that they're sort of long and straight. And then go down. And so the other thing to remember about what we're doing here is that let me get another daisy stitch in. So when you are coming to do your stitch next to the one you just made, when you come up at the bottom of the stitch here towards the center of the flower, you want these to be really super close together. When you come up, like right here, can you see that? You want to move over enough to give the rounded end, even though we're pulling them so that they're kind of long and straight, you want to move over enough so that you have enough space for that stitch, that rounded end to sit. See that? If I had come up really close to that, this one would be sort of sitting on top. And I don't want that. Again, I'm going to come up super close, almost right on top of where the other one started at the bottom there. 
and then when it comes time to come up make sure I move over enough and pull that one tightly so in the end this sort of starts to look like I mean not really like satin stitch but a little bit because it's just long it ends up being long straight stitches it's faster than satin stitch and there is a little bit of fabric showing you know inside here but that's okay that adds sort of adds to the texture so I'm right up here so I also gauge like when I'm at the when I know I'm at the center of the petal right here Am I at the center of the inside, you know, the center, like uh, near the center of the flower? Am I down here? Am I in the center? Like if I'm already over here, I've put these two too far apart. So I'm really right up here at the center of the petal on the outside, come up in the loop. And there is that one. Because these petals have very wavy curly ends on them and like this one is behind this one so we have this little situation right here so this petal comes around here but we have these little bitty short sections I actually had a different plan in mind when I drew this flower but like I said I changed everything so now what I'm going to do is because there's enough space in here I think I will go ahead and add maybe one more really short little daisy stitch to just fill that in just a little bit because when I come back and add the ruffle it's going to fill in you know this little space right here so it's going to be fine another thing I'm doing is because this petal is on top and this one is behind often I like I think I've mentioned throughout this design if you haven't heard me say it yet I, I'll say it several times you, if you want to differentiate where how to make one something look like it's on top of another thing you can do it with several different things texture height color like make it darker along here and lighter along here we're not really doing that with this and because this is variegated thread one thing i'm doing to help differentiate the petals a little bit is i am not just going to i finished here and i'm in my thread and i'm whatever this color is in the variegated part of the thread i am not uh, just gonna start with this petal because then that'll be the same it could be it could be the exact same color that I just was using and they will kind of run together the ruffled edge that we're gonna put on it in just a minute particularly on this one because it's gonna start you know more down in here and cover that up so it that's gonna help differentiate it so but I am just being a little extra cautious and so I'm gonna stop this petal here and start over on a different petal just like I did here I started here and then I used the same thread but I jumped over here so that the colors wouldn't the colors don't just run together that's all I'm trying to say and I just I, I mentioned this but because this petal is on top and I want the ruffles I'm not I don't want the ruffles to start here like all the other petals this the ruffle is going to start here and go over to here and stop here this one I don't want it to stop on the outside and end on the outside I want the ruffle to start down in here somewhere so in order to do that I need to have my daisy stitches I can't do it just exactly like this petal I can't have the daisy stitch the all the first daisy stitch go all the way to the edge I need it to end right about here and you'll see why when I show you how to, we're going to do the ruffle why that daisy stitch needs to end here so if that helps you to draw some different angles on these this petal and this petal are on top so anytime you have a the side of a petal that falls on top of another one you're going to change your angles up a little bit so that would be my first daisy stitch and then my next daisy stitch will come here and then the next one will go there like that and then i'm kind of back to the way i was before on going all the way out to the outside edge same thing when i get over here I want this one to kind of end here and then here here and then I can go out to the edge hopefully that makes sense it will make more sense when we're doing the ruffle and you'll see exactly why we needed to have such short daisy stitches right here so let me show you how that first one looks like as an actual stitch 
And I think with all that discussion I had about switching up the color, I don't know, honestly know how much of a difference that's going to make. Well, that's a different purple, so yeah. Still making sure I'm very close at the bottom. And then that next one is going to come up right there. All right, so see that? Uh, like I said, I'll just it's much easier to, to, to draw yourself some guidelines first so you're not just kind of winging it. I need to talk to you about this last petal I'm working on because the butterfly body is right smack on top of it. And so what do we do about that? Uh, sometimes I stitch around those elements. Right here, I am going to just stitch over the little bit of the butterfly body that is into this petal. I've already drawn some guidelines for this petal because this is one of those ones that sits on top, so I want, to, want it to angle that way. And so for this part of the petal, this stitching, I am going to just stitch right over the butterfly body. When I come to do the next step, the ruffle, I'm not going to put the ruffle because I don't want to, I'm going to have to be stitching on top of, over, these stitches and I don't need to stitch over the ruffle so the ruffle will be different but for these stitches just stitch the petal just like it's like the butterfly body is not there. Now we're going to work on the part of the petal that gives this entire flower its name. It's the ruffled flower so we're going to add a little ruffle to the edge of each petal and I am using two strands of the turquoise dyed thread and to start, I'm just, or what I'm going to be doing is putting two edged buttonhole stitches in the end of each of these daisy stitches. So to start, I'm going to come up right on the outside, just to the left of that rounded end of the daisy stitch. And so just like we would do, we've done on some other buttonhole stitches, I think maybe we haven't done them yet. I don't know. I can't remember where this is going to fall in the, in the whole thing, but anyway. To do the buttonhole stitch, come up, leave a loop here at the top, leave this on top, and then I'm just going to put my needle underneath, other threads in the way for just a minute, so I'm going to put it underneath the left leg, the left side of the daisy stitch, and I'm going to bring the needle and make sure that it goes inside that loop or on top of this thread, and I'm going to very gently pull it until it makes a little, little circle. But now I want to make another one. And so I will go under the right hand side of the daisy stitch, just like that. Same thing. Make sure that I'm going over that thread and then pull it very gently. Now make sure that is not sitting, make sure it's sitting on the beginning is a little tricky. All right, so there we go. Let's just make that, okay. So now I'm ready to just keep going. Now I'm gonna to go to the next daisy stitch on, and I kind of think of it as going on the left, you know, the little tacking stitch at the top of the daisy stitch. Put one of these, go underneath on the left side of that tacking stitch and bring it through. And then the next one go to underneath on the right side of the little tacking stitch. So this is the one on the left side. And I'm not pulling it really, really tight up against the end of that daisy stitch because I wanted to have a little bit of, um, you know, a little bit of uh, length to it. You know, it doesn't need to be super tight, otherwise it won't really show up. So there's the next one. And I can go to the next daisy stitch. And I'm going to go underneath the daisy stitch to the left of the tacking stitch and then again to the right of the tacking stitch. And I'll do a few more of these so you can kind of see how that ruffle begins to show up. And this is, you can kind of see it happening already. This is one of those stitches that you will probably need to let your thread hang pretty frequently while you're doing it because it does tend to twist your thread as you are moving along. And we can start to see that ruffle show up right there. Do one more. 
or two more rather. There's one and there's two. Oh, see, it's flipping on me. I need to let it hang and untwist. I'll do that after I do this stitch. Whoops, don't get it caught in your other stitching. All right, so see, there's the ruffle right there. And it's really, really a neat little edge. Nice way to just finish off that edge and it will cover up that extra space we left around each petal. And just, even when we get over to here, just put two little edged buttonhole stitches in the end of each daisy stitch. When you get to the end of one petal and you need to finish off that, that row of edging, then just take your needle and put it down behind the last little loop you made and now you can just i'll start on this daisy stitch that's way down here next but otherwise just just you can keep the same thread and keep going around to the next petal one tip that can be helpful when you're trying to put that needle underneath those little you know trying to kind of dig under there and get that needle underneath the either one of those bars of that daisy stitch is that you don't have to use the pointy end you can use the the rounded end and it makes it much easier because you don't catch on things so you can see here, I'm still making sure that it's going over the top of the thread, but when I pull it through, it's the same thing. And now I can do the same thing again. I just, here's the rounded end and I can fish around and find like that. And it's, it won't catch as easily. I mean, it still will catch, but it won't catch as easily on either the background fabric or any of the stitches around it like that. For the center of this ruffled flower, you're gonna start out by doing a satin stitch, uh, just like we did over here, but just fill in that center circle with satin stitch. And then the order of the things that we're gonna do next matters. So do this one first, and now we're gonna work on the outside ring, and then we will add French knots on top of that. But the stitch we're gonna use for the outside ring is one of my favorite stitches. It's called Turkey Work. I also tend to refer to it as the fringe stitch because it's perfect for fringe, but it's a really cool stitch because it can be used for fringe. It can be used for fur. Depends on how short or long you leave it and how much you uh, fluff it up. It can be great for short fluff or long fluff. It's, it's just has, it just has so many uses. You can, it, it's loops and you can leave them as loops or you can trim them many different things you can do all with the exact same stitch. So here is how to do the fringe stitch. You are going to, I'm gonna work on this in a ring, one ring right up next to the edges of the, the bottom edges of these petals. So come up. So it's like I said, it's a series of loops. And so make a loop like that Go down right next to where you came up. Right, so here's the part where you're going to leave a loop. And you're going to want to sort of hold it down with your other finger. Come up just to the right of that stitch there at the bottom. And now what we're going to do is make it, give it a little anchoring stitch to hold that loop in place. So that when we cut it, trim it, mess with it later, it doesn't come out. So now that's what I call the locking stitch. Now come up, oh, I did that wrong. When you come up next to this stitch, uh, come up in the center. So up, let me do it again. Let me just show you. So pretend this is your first stitch. So come up, go down next to where you came up. Now come up between those two stitches, like at the base, where those two stitches are, come up in between them. Whoops. Make sure you don't come up in the exact hole you went down in. So come up in between those stitches and put a little tiny locking stitch right at the base of that thread where it comes out. Now that loop is secure. You can tug on it and it's not going to come out. Now for the next stitch, come up between those stitches. You can see it's kind of dark, a dark thread. Make another loop, go down right next to it. 
come up in between, make a locking stitch. Now let me talk about the length of these loops. Depending on what you're wanting to do, the length of the loops might matter. In this case, I know I'm going to be trimming them off about right here. I don't want long fringe, so it's gonna, they're gonna be, it's gonna be really short fringe. So I just want to make sure my loops are longer, you know, taller than the, where I'm gonna cut it off. I don't want to leave, I mean, I don't need to leave a loop that is long like that. There's no reason to waste all that thread, especially when you're using this dyed variegated thread that you spent all this time on. You don't need to leave a loop that long because you're just gonna cut all that off and you're gonna waste all that thread. So for these loops, make them a little bit shorter, but just make sure they are longer than what you wanna trim. Now, if you are ever doing, whoops, I did it again. If you're ever doing uh, turkey work where you want to leave it as a loop, like if you're making a flower, like these are gonna be the petals, you will probably want to pay attention and make sure all the loops are exactly the same length. But we're gonna trim it off, so just make sure it's a little bit longer than what you wanna trim. Now, I'm gonna go all the way around here, make in a ring right here at the edge of these petals. There are all of my loops, and now it's time to trim them. So I've got some, the, my five inch micro tip detail scissors, which I love. And the first thing to do is to snip these little loops. Now you don't have to do that because you are gonna trim that loopy part off, but honestly, it makes it easier to see what's going on when you go ahead and just trim these for, or just cut these first. So I will do that. And with this flower in particular, you always need to be careful when you're d cutting your turkey work, but particularly with this one, because it has this loopy kind of loose stitch underneath it. So just make sure the whole time, particularly when we do this next section, be super careful not to pick up any of those threads when you are cutting now, particularly in this part. So now they're really long, don't want them that long. Now I need to trim these to, I'm not quite sure how short I'm gonna end up with them. Turkey work for me is always the kind of thing where you, where I trim it and a, a little bit and I see if I like it and if I wanna trim off a little bit more, I do. Cause you can always trim more off, you can't add it back on. So just be, I always sort of pull it up first and trim some off. I wanna go around the circle, all this little, these little ends that you're trimming off are gonna get in your way. And I find it easier to do this, right now it's in my hoop stand so it doesn't move, but it's really easier. This is one instance where it's better to take your hoop out of the hoop stand if you're using one so that you can move the hoop around and you can look at it you know, from flat on and rotate it so you can constantly see if you are uh, trimming it the way you want. Now, we don't have that much turkey stitch. Sometimes when you're doing a lot, you're trying to get dimensional, you know, rounded, whatever, it's much, that's much easier, but this is not too hard, but just, gra just gradually trim off more and more until you are happy with how long it is. A trick to use to get all that little stuff out of the way so you can see what you're doing is to use a piece of masking tape and gently pick up all those little, because they'll get in your way and you won't be able to tell what's, what's to cut and what's still there. So, all right, I've gotten that freshened up. I'll just do that repeatedly while I'm trimming. Okay, so I'm gonna go trim this as much as I think I, as long as I think I want it to be. But I'm always, always, always gonna be super careful, particularly right in here. See how that loopy stitch is underneath this fringe stitch? So I'm not gonna just like jam my scissors under there and just start cutting. I'm really, really gonna try to cut this one with them sticking up instead of flat against the flower. But anyway, just be super careful. I think I have trimmed it to where I want it. One thing to be aware of is 
and it's one of the cool things about turkey work and I kind of mentioned it earlier but the more you mess with this and fluff it rub it scrape it if you take your the tips of your scissors and go back and forth the masking tape if you keep doing that doing it over and over and over this will get fluffier and fluffier and fluffier in other words the threads themselves will just kind of get go to fluff instead of strands and i wanted more fringe here and not so much fluff so i was careful not to manipulate it or mess with it too much i mean you kind of have to to get it in place but i didn't like just you know do the masking tape 20 times or anything so just be aware of that if, if you get fluff it's gorgeous i love the fluff but i wanted fringe so i was careful not to do too much the last thing i'm going to do is to add a ring of French knots between the fringe and the center and the reason I did the fringe first and I'm doing the French knots after that is because it's a little easier to stay out of the way of the well to I'm going to use the French knots to cover the, the stitches the little locking stitches sort of cover that up and now you do have to be careful when you're pulling I'm not going to show you this because you've already seen me do French knots but just be careful when you're pulling that thread for the French knot through, it can kind of catch on one of these threads. So pull that thread slowly so you can make sure these, this fringe doesn't get caught in the thread as you're pulling the, the thread for the knot through to the back. So just put your ring of French knots and around that satin stitch center and you'll be done with this flower. Now that we've talked about thread painting and what it is and how to do it, Let's come back to the roofs on the castle because we are going to use, I mentioned way back when we were doing the castle, I mentioned that we were going to use a thread painting technique and we are. It is a little bit different though than the petals on that thread painted flower because on the flower we were blending one color that in, in a row here and then the next color was above it and the next color was above it. Here we're moving from left to right. In other words, this whole vertical section is one color. This vertical section is one color. This one's another color. And we're not, our stitches are gonna run vertically, not this way. And so in other words, on the petal, our colors were here, here, and here, and our stitches were running this way. Here, the colors are here, here, and here, but the stitches are running the same direction. So it's a little bit different. And in fact, we're really just going to, I don't really like to use the word rules, but we're gonna break the rules of thread painting. We're gonna use the same sort of stitching technique a little bit of like how the, the, the stitches work, but it's a little bit different with the colors. Let me show you what I mean. Like the towers, I am, you know, they're flat, but I'm using color to make them look like they are rounded. Same thing with the, the roof, the roofs on each one is I want them to look like they are rounded, but I, and I'm going to convey that with color. So with pink, but like a dark and then a medium and then a, a lighter pink, you'd look over here. All right. So the edge is going to be a slightly darker and then a sort of a more plummy color. And then we're going to use one of the dyed threads for the center. I have, just like on the petals, I've already stitched a line of split stitching across the bottom to give us that sort of rolled edge, particularly here because I really want it to look like it stands out, you know, from the tower itself. So I've already done that. But now, whereas on the petal, how we worked one color all the way across this way, we're going to work the first color all the way up this pointy little curved triangle. I'm starting out with this kind of, with all the roof's gonna be all one strand, all right? No two strand and then one strand, we're doing all one strand, all right? Starting out with this sort of reddish, dark pink red color. And here's why, well, let me, let me tell you what I do for the edge. So I am stitching over the split stitch edge, just like on the petal, and I, I'm just going to sort of work up this shape and maybe back down and just kind of back and forth. And that's where it's different from the petal. You know, it mattered where you came up and where you went down and you came up in the previously stitched area and down in the unstitched. I'm not going to pay any attention to that. Sometimes I'm going to work, you know, up and down and sometimes the stitch will start here and go down. Staggered stitches, still the same. I'm not trying to get clumps of stitches that are all the same length. 
So that's why it's just kind of a free for all where you put your stitches. It's really just fill it in, fill the section in with stitches of different lengths. I mean, it's very, it's about that loosey goosey. All right. But on this edge, I do want a nice smooth line for the edge. So I've already made one stitch right here and I'm going to jump up and the edge is going to be almost like a fake stem, stem stitch. But by that, I mean, I'm not going to go down right where that stitch ended like a back stitch. I'm going to come along here and I'm going to sort of push that stitch aside about halfway down. So it starts to get that little curve. I'm going to come up a little bit, come on that outside edge, push that stitch over just a little bit. See, so see how I'm getting a nice curved, smooth line that is following the curved edge of the roof. The tower, the roofs on the bottom two towers, these right here, they have straighter sides, so that's not quite as critical for that curve. But so let's say I've, I'm not all the way up to the top, but that's fine. I'm going to jump back down here and I'm going to start filling in with my stitches. And here's where I say it's really just fill in with stitches of different lengths. Just work up and down a little bit left to right. I will get kind of a foundation laid here at this bottom edge. So now, now that I've gotten some color laid in there, some stitches, now's the part where I can just sort of kind of go wherever I want. I'm going to come up in the stitched part here, go up. Now I can put a stitch in that goes the other direction. I know I mentioned on the petals that I did not want to go down in the down into the areas that were already stitched because you get a little divot, but you know what? I'm just not going to worry about that here. It's a little tiny section. I just want to get color filled in this area. And those little divots are just not going to really show up in this area. Now I can, you can see this right here. See how I have a little blue showing right there. I want to make sure that's not there. So however I get that covered up, that's what I'm going to do. Didn't really get it covered up on that stitch, but that did it. Make sure at the bottom I have completely stitched over that split stitch line. I think I need maybe one more stitch to fill in there at the bottom. No, let's do two more. So similar to the thread painting we did on the flower, make sure it's nice and full. You don't have any fabric showing, but now I can hop back up here and just go whichever direction I want to go. I can jump ahead and come back. I'm going to come up here and finish out that outline edge. And these roofs are so, you know, each section is not a big section. So that's why one reason I'm using one strand. And right there, and I have a kind of a little hole right there. Want to cover that up. And really, I think that section is done. Okay, that's all that took. Now let me go grab my second color. Now I have one strand of this very kind of plummy, plum pink. I'm not using any dyed, oh no, sorry. I am going to use a dyed thread, but these first two colors are not dyed threads. They're just solid color. And at first, this color is going to look very similar to the one, especially when you're just doing one strand. Uh, it's going to look very similar to that really reddish pink that we just used. But it has just enough of a difference that as the color builds up, you will see it. And that red edge kind of makes that um, edge of the roof look like it's, you know, receding but same thing kind of follow the 
technique of the long and short stitch, but you just don't have to worry about the same, I don't mean worry, I mean you just don't have to be quite as specific as we were on the thread painted petal. So now I kind of have a first section, now I'm going to just, ah, I keep dropping my needle. Now I'm just going to fill that in with stitches that are different lengths. That's all I got to do. Make sure you don't have any thin sections. This middle section is similar to the petal in, in that you're stitching at some different angles. So over here on this side, these stitches go that way. In the middle, they go sort of straight up. And on this side, they angle this way. And this whole thing is really a good example of using long and short just strictly as a filling stitch. You know, you could use, if you had an area you needed to fill, particularly a large area, and it's too large for satin stitch because it would just be too loose. And if you just, even just, like I said, just one color, if you have all one color, a solid color, and you want to fill it with a stitch that's nice and secure against the fabric and is smooth and, you know, fills in the whole area, that's why long and short can work in that instance. If you're not even blending color, you're just filling. Because we're not really blending the colors here. We're not blending one color into another. I'm using the color, the different colors, the three different colors, a dark, kind of a medium, and then a lighter one, to convey um, the, the light and shadow but I'm not blending the colors like I did on the petal. So anyway, that's just a way, that's, keep that in mind. If you're looking for a filling stitch that you need to fill with a stitch that is nice and secure, not loose like a satin stitch, you know, doesn't have long, long stitches in it, remember that you can use long and short stitch, thread painting. So all you gotta do for the roof is Fill in this middle section and then the this section and this section are just the opposite of this. So this will be the plummy color and this will be that kind of pinky red, dark pinky red. These little teeny tiny spires on top of each roof. We're going to use one strand of that dyed um, navy purple, the same color that we used for the windows. And I am going to just make one I'm going to be very careful that I get this needle to come up exactly in the right place. One straight stitch for the spire itself. And I'm actually going to tack that down in the back if you want to make a knot or whatever. But I'm just running that back there so it's kind of secured. It's not like a loose stitch. Because now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a really teeny tiny French knot right over that one strand. So I'm gonna, uh, I think all of the other spires, finials, whatever they're called, I, call, I think I call them finials in the pattern. Uh, I did, oh, like this one. Okay, it has two French knots. So the, the bottom one is one strand wrapped twice. So I've come up, here's one, two, and very carefully go down and pull that thread down so that dot is right on top of that and then I'm going to put one more teeny tiny little knot. This one is just wrapped once so there's one. I make sure I just oh, do it again. I don't want to move too far off the spot. And there's the second one. All right, so there are the roofs and the spires, and now our castle is finished.